Hello again, everybody. This is Mr. Builder here with you from the square table today. Might be wondering why I'm saying hello again, and I recorded this entire tutorial before Fraps decided to inform me that it had silently crashed in the background without letting me know at all. So I'm going to try this again. Today I'm here to do redstone tutorials. I had some tutorials on my channel a long time ago. Unfortunately, the video quality was horrendous, and on top of that, all of the content is generally outdated in almost every aspect in 1.3. For those of you who noticed in the bottom hotbar, I have an item from 1.3 that I will be toying around with because I'm using the 1.3 pre-release. This is before August 1st when 1.3 has become available as a standard client. If you're playing this before August, August 1st and you're trying to figure out why things aren't working, it's because you need 1.3. If you're playing this after August 1st, ignore that. You're playing 1.3 already. So, I'd like to start with the very basics of Redstone and work our way up in a series of tutorials. I'm going to start you guys off at the very beginning, understanding power sources, or understanding inputs. We're going to go over the inputs, their different uses, why they're important, and what they can do. So the first thing that we have, the very first one, and probably the first that a lot of players have built, is pressure plates. There are two kinds of pressure plates that exist in Minecraft. Both of them function almost identically in most ways. Pressure plates are a temporary power source that require an entity, an entity being a player, an animal, or a monster, to stand on them. They will provide a temporary source of power, or they will provide power for as long as an entity, entity is present on them. Both of the pressure plates will function in this manner. So you might be asking yourself at this point, if you're not familiar with redstone, why are there two different kinds of pressure plates if they're practically the same? There are a few key differences that loan validity to both of these pressure plates. The stone pressure plate requires an entity to be standing on it to activate. However, it cannot be activated by throwing an object on it. The wood pressure plate by opposition can be activated by entities standing on it. It can also be activated by items being thrown on it. And it can also be activated as of 1.3 prolonged by having an arrow fired at it. This will cause the pressure plate to provide power until such a time when the arrow despawns or a player picks it up. Let's move on to the next temporary power source, which is buttons. Buttons are a pretty cool temporary power source. Uh, one of the main differences between buttons and pressure plates is that pressure plates can only be placed on the ground, whereas buttons can only be placed on walls. Buttons in the recent update, as far as I can tell, are a little bit bigger than the old buttons, a little easier to see that way. They can still be hidden by placing them on a smooth stone surface. As you can see, if I just grab a smooth stone surface right now really quickly and place a button on it, they camouflage decently well. Buttons will, like pressure plates, provide a temporary power output. However, buttons cannot be held down like pressure plates can, although they can be flicked pretty rapidly. In a lot of systems, that'll cause problems, but if that's all you need, that's all you need. Next up, we have one of my personal favorites and one of the most commonly used, the lever. The lever has received an update in 1.3, as have many things. New levers can be placed on the ground, as in previous versions, on the walls, and upside down on the roof. This makes them possibly the most versatile to place power source that exists in the game. No matter how you place the lever though, it will behave the same way. When hooked up to a redstone circuit, switching it will provide power, and the power will remain until a player switches the switch back manually. You have to flick the lever back manually. And this allows for permanent sources of power, uh, temporary sources that you might want to use for are doors or anything like that, whereas a permanent source you might want to use, for example, for a light switch, but we'll discuss that a little more when we get to outputs. Next up on the agenda is another one of my favorites and a new addition from 1.3. It's not at the end because I love it too much to wait. It's the tripwire. A lot of people were asking for an update that included something along the lines of the tripwire. Players used to accomplish a tripwire by laying out a long row of pressure plates with redstone wire run underneath them one block below in a fashion such as this, so that whenever an entity would step on any of the pressure plates it would send a signal of redstone current. It is now much easier to accomplish this task and it looks a lot better. Simply place down two blocks that are in opposition to each other across a horizontal plane. These cannot be placed vertically, so you cannot place one and then have a gap and simply place it between here, you must do it horizontally. To place it, you simply place down two hooks, the formulas for which, of course, the crafting recipes will be shown for everything on the screen if you haven't noticed yet. Once the hooks are placed, simply lay down string, which can be obtained from wool or killing spiders, between them. Once you lay down from one end, here, 
and get to the last one, you'll hear a soft click and see a new position which will indicate that they are hooked together successfully. Keep in mind that trip wires cannot corner like this successfully. They must be in a straight line. They work similarly to pressure plates in almost every single way. When entities step on them, they will create a redstone current signal, and they will send that signal until the entity is no longer on them. They work more similarly to wooden pressure plates than to stone, as they can be activated by objects being thrown on them. Additionally, similarly to wooden pressure plates, these can be activated by firing an arrow. The arrow does not need to accurately hit the string, only needs to hit the square that the string is in, and it will update. This again activates it until the arrow is picked up or despawned. One nice thing about tripwires is that they don't need to be placed on the ground. They can be placed in the air with suspended string between. The way you do this is simply place two hooks across from each other at the same level, horizontally, place string against one, and then just build the string against each other as if they were half slabs. They'll connect in the same manner. Connecting next to the hook at a second level will cause the same effect where power is sent. An additional application of this idea can be shown here. What I've done here is laid out a tripwire through a hole, then wired this down to the ground. The idea here is that if this were a level field that the player were walking on, it could have a system set up to indicate when a player has fallen through, or activate a certain system when a player falls through a hole. This could not be done previously without having the player first step on a pressure plate above and having the system activate this way. This allows the system to activate as the player falls through, and prevents players from avoiding activation of the system as long as the hole is slim enough that they're forced to fall through the string. An additional fact about tripwire is that destroying one end of the tripwire, or even both ends, will not naturally clean up the string. This must be done by hand, and is recommended to keep things looking organized and avoid losing or wasting string. The next one I come up to is the detector rail. Setting up a system to demonstrate this will require a few pieces. You'll need rail, a minecart, and a detector rail to even begin using this. We'll lay out a simple circuit circle. We'll lay out a simple circle of rail here. Circuit of rail, jeez. And once this is laid out, we'll add a detector rail here. With the detector rail placed, we can now take our redstone, which is apparently in our inventory now, and wire it out as we would any standard connection. What will happen is that a cart, here's a new feature of 1.3 by the way, you can move your cart using your arrow keys. When a cart comes up and passes over a detector rail, while the cart is on the detector rail square, the redstone will become active. Once the cart is off of the square, it will become deactivated. As you can see here, as the cart approaches the square, it is active and then deactivated. Simple as that, and it's just like that. The final item, but definitely not the least important, is redstone torches. We'll discuss their behavior in depth as we continue along, but there are a few things that need to be noted about redstone torches now. Redstone torches can be placed in a variety of ways. They can be placed on a block or flat on the ground. They can also be placed on the side of a block. Each of these will vary how they function in a circuit, particularly as an out as it sorry, particularly as an input, this will change how they affect the redstone wire around them. Torches on the side of a block will feed power to the three cardinal directions touching them, but will not feed power backwards over the block. Redstone torches on top of a block will not feed power to anything at a lower level. However, it will feed power to anything at a standard level in the same method as one on the ground. A redstone torch on the ground will feed power to all four of the cardinal directions. However, these two setups have a flaw that we'll discuss when we look at redstone torches as part of circuitry instead of as an input. Redstone torches are important because they play a role as an input, an output, and as a main part of circuitry. A final note about inputs is how they can interact with redstone that is not directly connected to them, to allow players to hide wiring underground as would be seen by this temporary situation, you can see that I can hide this redstone completely underground. What allows this is that redstone inputs can affect redstone a full block away. As you can see, when I stand on this pressure plate, even though it's not directly touching the redstone, as it would be in a normal wiring situation, it still affects the redstone beneath it. The same application applies with switches. 
Levers can be do, do the same thing either on top of or on the side of a block. Redstone torches have a small difference. Redstone torches on top of a block can affect redstone blocks above them. So a block can be placed on top of this torch, like so, whoops, and the redstone placed on top will become powered. However, redstone to power redstone below a torch, it must be placed on the side. As stated previously, this has a flaw in circuitry, and this is the preferred method in most circuits. This will be explained as we discuss redstone torches in a circuit. Hey guys, Mr. Builder here. I hope you guys enjoyed the video on the redstone tutorials. There's more to come in the future. Please check out the Gamer Square Table, which you can find at youtube.com forward slash Gamer Square Table. There will be a link in the description. And subscribe to both my channel and that channel. It would be greatly appreciated. Favorite and like if you liked the video. And let me know if you'd like to see anything else or if you have any particular questions in the comments below.